Hello and welcome to the session. Now our title today is Testing Times. I'm going to be looking at exams and assessment with a particular focus on English. Now we're starting with the assumption that you're all familiar with the basics of English assessment at GCSE. So I won't be patronising you by running through the criteria, grades and levels. And during the session, what we are going to look at is assessment in a general sense, in terms of some of the current issues, questions and thinking, but also reflecting on how those various issues relate to English and to the NET curriculum. Now, there will be a follow-up session appearing over the next few weeks, which will run through the GCSE English questions, and that's just for awareness and as a bit of a bonus. So let's start by pinning down what we mean by assessment, which I'm aware sounds like a very, a very obvious and very unnecessary question. Now, in our previous session, we discussed the nature of a curriculum, or more correctly, of curricula. Now, one of the key messages that was hopefully conveyed was the importance of knowing your north, of having a clear sense of the destination and the direction of travel. Now, assessment is, if we're looking for the simplest possible definition, the set of methods by which we locate our students and map their progress on their curriculum journey. Now, to quote the ever excellent Tom Sherrington, it is by comparing our current position with the destination that we can plot our course and plan our immediate next steps. Now, assessment methods have undoubtedly changed dramatically over the past 15 years. Key Stage 3 tests disappeared in 2008, followed by the scrapping of Key Stage 3 levels. Schools across the country introduced their own levelling systems, ranging from some primary school style uh, sprint trackers to entirely skills-based descriptive levelling, right the way through to the dropping down of GCSE grades down to Year 7, uh, the solution that actually became most widespread. Now at GCSE, coursework was abandoned in favour of controlled assessment, which was in turn abandoned in favour of an entirely terminally examined course. Grades at GCSE moved from A star G to grades 1 to 9, with the additional complication of speaking assessments running with their own entirely different grading system. Now, in terms of classwork, we saw a succession of intensive marking fashions from APP, a Q stage 3, to uh, deep marking, to double marking, and even triple marking. Um, best practice advice saw students marking their own work and then partners marking their own, marking uh, their, their partners' work, then staff marking the work, and then staff remarking work, sometimes even with other staff marking the work as well, just to really enforce the visible standard. But at one point, as an anecdote, I came across marking which was all but seeing a rainbow on the page, uh, with students writing in black and peer assessing in purple, staff were writing positive comments in green and negative comments in red, with yellow boxes then drawn to show students where to put their, their redrafts and so on. We had the horror at one point of apparently randomly distributed verbal feedback given stamps strewn across pages and unmarked work being ticked and initialed just to show it had been seen. Staff of the time will remember those, those rounds of subject staff in departments such as maths, complaining about having to take two hours to mark a set of books, only for English staff to spend ten hours or more just to turn a set round. Now, marking has moved on significantly. It has, with a range of strategies designed to speed up the process to increase efficiency, uh, that's including things like smart targets and dirt targets, through to success grids and marking tokens. However, there's also been a far greater focus on fairness of assessment in a formal sense, uh, in terms of you know, additional time, use of readers, scribes, laptops and reading pens. Now, many of those strategies across there have stalled on the runway or have run into their own issues. Some have had a much more lasting impact. And we still don't forget in a state of almost continuous change. More recently, we've seen students graded and ranked by staff only to fall foul of a historically biased algorithm, and then the additional complication of staff assessed grades being reintroduced, and the resultant grade inflation off the back of that. Right now, as I create this session, we sit here halfway through year 11, with a consultation underway, but no definite decisions as to how students will be graded, what assessment methodology will be used, what evidence base will be required, or even when assessments will take place or grades will be awarded. Hopefully we'll achieve some clarity soon.
In terms of teaching and ongoing internal and lesson-based assessment, the forced shift to online learning has also created some new challenges and opportunities. It's necessitated some new marking and feedback methods. It's emphasised the importance of pursuing technologically based marking solutions. And it's also unshackled online interaction, which is in its own right a form of intervention. So let's turn to another key question. How do we assess? And that essentially also draws us into the more fundamental question. Why do we assess? Now, Dylan William, in his excellent um, embedded formative assessment, boils teaching down to three key processes. One, finding out where learners are in their learning. Two, establishing where they're going. And three, determining how to get there. An assessment essentially acts as the first of these. Now, what's reassuring in William's list is that it fits as part of a process. After all, it's a mistake to see an assessment as something self-contained and self-defined as being an end in and of itself. What makes an assessment valid or invalid is not the assessment itself, but the function it serves, what we're able to infer from it. Now, for William, it's important to acknowledge, almost double tautologically, that a test tests what a test tests. And essentially, we need to understand the intended and designed scope of any assessment, and also to acknowledge the limitations of any test design in providing information outside of those parameters. For example, GCSE grades originally were simply an assessment of a single student's skill and learning, but they've mutated over time to become something used to inform judgments about the quality of education provided by a school or department or even a teacher, which is a purpose for which they hadn't been intended. For many of you at a similar stage to me, for example, you may remember the days before progress data became the key concern, where schools were simply judged on the headline A star to C figure. And that's ignoring the relative ability or social context of the cohort, with some quite leafy suburban schools with high headlines seen as the gold standard. And schools catering at the opposite end of the spectrum for underprivileged students in deprived areas really suffering by comparison. Now, as a measure of achievement by that student on that day, under those conditions, taking into account all their social factors, the exam essentially served its purpose. But in terms of identifying how well a school was catering for its students, well, far, far less so. And a poor assessment design can be extraordinarily disruptive. If we think, for example, of students caught out in GCSE exams, not because they were lacking in ability or effort, but because the question was obfuscated by an unfamiliar word, or because the instructional verb was ambiguous. I mean, in recent exams, for example, words such as apprehension, futile, solitary, misogyny, and misanthropy have all tripped up otherwise able students. And there's the recurring issue in English literature, in particular, of students confused by an alternative label for a theme. Pointlessness versus futility, for example, or salvation versus redemption, to turn to a Christmas carol, um, or social inequality and the class system, if we're thinking about an inspector calls. Now, in schools and classrooms, we have some control over this. But there's also the broader need to proof students against the potential for this to occur in another GCSE exam. And again, the issue of vocabulary rears its head, which I realise is a recurring thread through lots of these sessions. Students need access to the range of vocabulary, but they also need flexible understanding of the underpinning concepts that actually unify everything. Now, where students are hampered by the language or the form of an assessment rather than by the conceptual challenge, we're assessing what William calls construct irrelevant skills. Now, the, UAQ, the AQA language papers are an attempt to ameliorate this issue through the escalating complexity of the paper from questions one to four on what William would see as a difficulty model. And we'll talk about that more later. Now, alternative coping mechanism can be seen uh, through the year one phonics screening check, where the use of alien or nonsense words such as brip and snorb ensure a focus on construct relevant factors rather than construct irrelevant aspects. Now, students unquestionably 
respond best to questions and tasks with which they're familiar, and when they understand what they are being assessed on. However, it's also true that the more that assessment is factored into a curriculum, both in terms of assessment points and in terms of familiarisation with assessment methods, the narrower the curriculum becomes as a result, the more the teaching becomes a process of teaching to, teaching about, and teaching as a reaction to the test. It's no surprise, for example, that for many schools, the terminal assessments that students will sit become pretty much the sole driver of their programme of study, rather than the wider development of skills. As an anecdote for the purpose of exemplification, uh, a friend of mine, let's call him Bill because it's his name, um, he's a skilled and he's a respected consultant anaesthetist. He bought a piano and he asked me for advice about classical sheet music Dubai. Now his intention was to learn to play a single piece of music perfectly rather than to learn to play the piano in a broader sense. Another friend taught his son to drive by driving together to the local sports centre each day, something that he came to do perfectly. But given a driving lesson by his uncle, a driving instructor, the son completely fell apart when attempting to drive anywhere else. Now in both cases, the focus had become too much on the single route. It had narrowed. It became all about the single piece rather than about the acquisition and the application of the skills and the understanding. Now we have the same issue in schools. Students need, they need to understand assessment methods, of course they do. They need to understand the criteria and how to work with them. But they also need the flexibility of application based on the broader foundation of knowledge and understanding in order to, con to, to contextualise the question and the information. If we're not careful, we end up thinking from a short-term perspective and attempting to teach students a single piece, that single route, rather than the skills that would enable them to play any piece or drive any route. The kind of teaching that would see students unable to answer a question that was worded slightly differently uh, to usual, or that contained an unfamiliar word. Now to return to that question about the purpose of the assessment, it's tempting to see assessment as set up along a series of, of oppositions. Is it formative? or summative, for example? Is it teacher marked or peer assessed? Is it internal or external? Is it skills or content based? In practical terms, however, several of these are completely artificial or sort of oppositions. To turn to William again, quotation from him. The teacher can use the same assessment both formatively and summatively. The terms formative and summative make much more sense as descriptions of the function that assessment data serve rather than of the assessments themselves. Phrase another way, an assessment in and of itself is neither valid nor invalid, formative nor summative. It's how it's used to become informative that decides that. That said, there are some useful guiding principles. One links back to the accessibility of the assessment. It's the idea of gaming logic, ensuring, just as computer games have increasingly demonstrated, the importance of balancing the attainment of an absolute standard with the ongoing pitching of challenge at a level that's achievable. Now, th for those of you who are into your, your educational theory, we are, of course, talking about essentially the ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development. So, for example, it's unfair to simply leave a grade nine student endlessly repeating the same quality of performance, endlessly in similarly pitched assessments, without raising the challenge for them individually. Now, this idea of the constantly shifting the dynamic, organic level of challenge also links to the phasing of the assessment. Now again, look back 10, 20 years, mention the word assessment, and you'd be told that almost all assessments in schools took place at the end of a unit, one size fits all, usually at the end of a term or a half term, with the intention being that this would provide concluding data to show how far students had come. What this didn't provide, though, was the insight needed in a practical sense to adapt the teaching before that point, to adjust flexible, structured teaching and assessments as well, in order to focus on improving the learning. This also ignores the majority of assessment that, as we know now, is an active and ongoing process. And as uh, Hattie one of the great you know, um, theorists and researchers in terms of education, as he showed all too clearly in his visible learning synthesis. In lesson feedback, 
face-to-face -face feedback and peer assessment are far more immediate, they're more frequent, they're more applicable and more impactful than an assessment tagged on the end of a unit that just provides data to be waved around and to look impressive. This is also an issue that we can zoom down to uh, in terms of the micro level in terms of English. After all, an extended piece of writing that we mark afterwards can only show so much and feedback offered at that point can only influence improvements so much. Though it's useful in terms of you know, complete structures and lines of discussion in essays. The interactive element, the feedback offered during the process and in the moment, is far more likely to have an immediate and active impact. And we think, for example, of you know, live marking in terms of a, a current policy. That said, in English, it's important to evaluate against both the small scale, you know, the idea, the quotation, the terminology, and the overall structure and holistic impact, the response, the structure, etc. To draw it together at this point, assessment becomes an attempt to find the Goldilocks zone, that centre of the Venn diagram. Detailed enough to ensure improvement, but not so detailed that it becomes unwieldy, you know, overwhelming the students. It, it's got to be frequent enough to ensure that improvement becomes a continuous process, but not so frequent that it displaces teaching. It's got to become specific enough that every student gains useful insight, but not so specific that um, broader comparisons become impossible or that teachers struggle with the marking load. Summative enough to offer a clear sense of situating a student on their journey, but also formative enough to encourage action moving forwards. So when do we assess and at how often? Now again, we've seen extremes in the past, you know, weekly assessments, mid-unit assessments, and then half-termly assessments, uh, you know, exams. That was quite a, a common model to have all those together with all the marking that suggests. There's the old saying, isn't there, about weighing the pig. And clearly uh, there were a lot of, you know, very thoroughly quantified hogs out there. Now again, to offer an anecdote for exemplification, there's the issue of marking perceived as a proxy for teaching. The perspective that unmarked work meant ineffective teaching. And that's the kind of thinking that led to teachers in some schools I've seen working back through exercise books months later in order to get them marked and visually ready for a book scrutiny. You know, marking not for student improvement, because the gap between completion and feedback has made it almost certainly meaningless, but just to keep senior staff off the teacher's back. It's the same logic as the student last week, in actual fact, who asked me whether they could write their exam response and then go back and plan it. Or, you know, equally to the practice of awarding what staff finally admitted to calling boggy grades in one apartment I came across, where students would sometimes be given a grade deliberately high enough or close enough to their target so that senior staff would if you'll excuse my phrasing, bugger off and not make a fuss about it for the teachers. And they would literally call them bugger off grades, bog grades or boggy grades. Now, different assessment styles suit different needs. Short term assessments with rapid assessment interpretation action cycles are generally accepted to have the most immediate and rapid gains for students. And this can include classroom based live feedback during tasks and real time writing in lessons. These are also likely to impact positively on student engagement because it becomes an interactive and a, a dynamic process and also on the teacher's ability to adapt content and delivery both individually and for groups of learners. And that's a point on which both Hattie and William would agree you know, in terms of the effectiveness of short-term assessment linked to spaced learning rather than mask learning and purely summative use of assessment. Now, that's a battle that I've come across fought in a number of schools, including some battles that I've had to be involved in. Staff who only ever want to assess at the end of a unit based on what was taught in that unit. And then on the other side, staff who see the value of assessing during a unit or in order to set up the next unit. There's also an argument I've come across in relation to English that short and rapid assessment cycles don't fit the subject. But this misses the possibility for different assessment styles performing different functions in the subject. You know, not every piece of work a student produces in English is an hour-long essay. In the same way that not every assessment that we do is, you know, a, a 10 mark spelling test. In fact, the majority of assessment that we do in English is the kind of low stakes, 
high frequency assessment that is most meaningful. And that's, you know, from live marking and lessons to self and peer review and, and crucially also the collaborative learning structures that we use throughout our lessons, each one of which represents a very regular, very low stakes, very interactive and potentially high impact peer assessment activity, regardless of whether students realise that that's what's happening. Assessment in this style also lends itself to interrupting the forgetting cycle with a due nod to uh, Ebbinghaus's research. It helps to address the transience of memory. Revisiting something through forced recall and retrieval helps to reinforce recall and retrieval. And if phased carefully, it helps to shift from the short term to the medium and then to the long term memory. And that's precisely why there's been such a focus recently on the integration and distribution of rapid short term assessments linked to active recall, spaced and phased repetition and so on. And you think about all the resources in NET that we've seen that do those things in terms of the need to know books and so on. Now, we do in English have a need for this, clearly, in the sense of driving both the micro and the macro in terms of skills. Short term rapid recall and retrieval is, is crucial for remembering quotations, for learning and gaining confidence in applying terminology and definitions for, crucially again, acquiring and expanding vocabulary. However, only ever testing immediately after completing something only ever gives a snapshot of that moment, not of the retention and the integration of that learning. Hence the importance of phasing and distributing assessments over time. Now a key idea at this point in terms of working memory is that of the schema of the mental set. Single pieces of information can be factored into existing pieces of information to create a broader mental structure, a broader mental form, with a key factor being that a schema, that resulting set of information, then functions as a single item to be recalled. So a piece of information, for example, can then be recalled along with a set of related ideas and associations that come with it as a set. Short-term rapid retrieval can then also contribute to the building of schema of those broader structures. But these also require the same or similar kinds of active recall, spaced and phased repetition, and so on. And this brings in all those broader macro-level English factors, you know, interpretive structures, lines of debate, lines of discussion, lines of thought, you know, narrative and character constructs, uh, even essay sections. Longer term assessment cycles beyond that do also serve a purpose, allowing insight into comparative general progress across classes, uh, the wider learning progress made by students in uh, a holistic sense, and also the effectiveness and consistency of curriculum alignment across groups and cohorts. And let's be clear here, alignment is really important for effective assessment. Without proper curriculum alignment from student to student, from class to class, from academy to academy, we cannot have fully effective assessment in terms of comparability and validity. And this is one key reason why it can be such a concern to see teachers heading off curriculum in order to simply teach to a test, such as you know, an example from last year when I walked into a classroom to find a teacher working through a paraphrased version of the question in the exam that the students would sit the next day short-term apparent gains in achievement, yes, but without any meaningful ability to interpret the data and a needlessly narrowed curriculum. Part of that alignment, however, is also about ensuring that there is time built in after an assessment to refine the curriculum, to remap and replan the teaching and the reteaching moving forwards, to address misconceptions and, and, and so on. After all, this is not simply about addressing issues with this specific task, but about addressing what can be inferred about the student's knowledge, their understanding and their application. If we look at our English assessments in NET, for example, the longer term mapping of assessment becomes very, very significant. There's often pressure to assess in a piecemeal fashion, to only assess one GCSE subject at a time or one Key Stage 3 topic. Now, while this may offer an accurate insight into that student's performance in that topic at that moment, it doesn't offer the most useful insight into the longer term integration of what has been learned 
In addition, assessing, say, Shakespeare in the first term, creative writing in the second, and, say, poetry comparison in the third, may give some cumulative performance data to serve the headline function, and again, we're back to results to wave around rather than to meaningfully interpret, but it doesn't allow for comparable performance data across the year. If a student, say, achieved a grade 5 in section A on paper 1, but a grade 3 a term later on section B on paper 1, apart from saying that they were stronger on section A a term ago, there's not a lot that can be inferred in terms of improvement, in terms of current performance on section A, or in terms of the benefit from a cumulative perspective. Testing over time means to enable reflection on both the continuity and the accumulation and to allow time afterwards for that reflection in application. Now this is of course the logic of the current Key Stage 3 assessment format, assessing the range of skills rather than simply short-term content, and also allowing continuity and comparability across each assessment phase with time allowed before the end of the half term, and so the ability to react, to review, to reteach, and so on, as needed in terms of what comes next. As a contrasting example in terms of GCSE, a real example uh, taken from the 2020 to the 2021 academic year, an issue relating to this came up for steps one and two, where due to COVID-related disruption, the majority of academies completed single papers in order not to overload the students or to overload the staff. After all, after lockdown, the only real conclusion likely to be drawn for step one was the students had missed a lot and there were gaps in knowledge, in understanding, in conceptualization, in application and, and so on. So when step two occurred, there was also then an additional issue, which was the proportion of students who missed some or all of the paper. So how do we then report that step two data? Do we collate the paper completed with the paper from step one? Do we calculate progress from one to the other, allowing for the fact that the two papers test different skills? What about for literature, where the texts across the two papers are completely different? What do we do for students who missed sections? Do we leave them blank? Do we plug the gaps with data from other sections? Even though we run the risk at that point of a, a self-referential loop in attempting to measure progress. And what figures do we report? Four plus five plus and seven plus, but they'll be low because of the amount that's been missed, or three plus four plus and six plus, since these perhaps indicate more accurately where students will be. Now it's of course at that point that the departmental QA, QA uh, sorry, the QLA becomes absolutely crucial. Something that breaks those headline figures down into meaningful skill-based chunks that staff and students can then use to plan what comes next and to address gaps. You know, even if it's only partial data, you can still do something useful with that. And in many ways, that's the more significant assessment output from the process, from a learning progress and achievement perspective. All of which also then prompts the key question, what are we assessing? Now, sometimes we do need the broadest possible view of learning across a cohort a floodlight to borrow William's metaphor but more often it's a spotlight that is most useful diagnostically and reflectively. Now arguments about how to assess are often really proxy arguments for how we define English and how we define the skills you know about what English language or English literature really is. With a clear curriculum with clear conceptualization and clear educational construct assessment becomes far easier far more logical and far less controversial. If we take, for example, the NET Key Stage 3 curriculum, one of the key driving factors is the idea of tracing concepts and skills throughout all the schemes of learning, so that the curriculum functions holistically. This means that assessments need to focus on assessing progress in the skills and the concepts, rather than simply in whatever topic happens to be studied at that point. Since skills and concepts track throughout all schemes, this also means that any skills-based assessment delivered properly, offers a clear marker on the learning journey, and then reviews and reflects on what has gone before, and steers and helps to influence what comes next. Now, an old-fashioned assessment style would have been to study a, a Shakespeare play, say, in Year 7, complete an assessment based on the Shakespeare play at the end of that, consisting of a single essay question that all students would attempt to answer, 
and then to move on to a different topic, returning to Shakespeare a year later in year eight. Now, clearly, there are a range of issues with that sort of assessment. It's limited, it prevents transferable inference, it doesn't allow adaptability for different students or levels of achievement, and simply measures without you know, feeding, to return to the earlier pig-weighing image. Learning is made up of a mixture of information, collation, interpretation, and application. In a more simple sense, it can be divided into both substantive knowledge, stuff, and disciplinary knowledge. How, how that stuff is processed and applied. The assessment of substantive knowledge is, is of course useful and it's well served by retrieval quizzes, closed questions and so on. But it's the disciplinary knowledge that's more important in many ways. However, that disciplinary focus also leads to some necessary ambiguity and uncertainty. If the focus of your teaching and your assessment is to ensure and measure understanding of substantive content, it can be done with a very high level of predictability, accuracy, and reasonably confidently guaranteed success. Something far more possible in mathematics, for example. If you're trying to ensure high performance in subjects with a lower proportion, arguably, of substantive content, and more centered on disciplinary processes, as in, say, English, we can only increase and improve the probability of success. Now, improving process learning, the applied disciplinary knowledge, means layering up the component skills through the cumulative effect of feedback over time. But since the relationship between classroom learning and final assessment in English can only ever be probabilistic, the challenge is to do both, to embed and interrelate both substantive and disciplinary knowledge, and thus initiatives, again, such as the Need to Know books, the recipe books, the quotation cards, the know it or show it slips, and so on. Now, there were several discussions with individual teachers when the 2020 curriculum and the new style Key Stage 3 assessments were first introduced around why an assessment during a Shakespeare scheme didn't simply assess understanding of Shakespeare's writings, seeking to weight more in favour of, in a sense, the substantive knowledge and the short-term disciplinary knowledge. The difficulty here is that an assessment like that of necessity can, can only reflect backwards or forwards to further study of Shakespeare's writings, something for most academies that would be a year away, making it irrelevant as soon as it's happened. More fundamentally, it ignores the importance of teaching the underlying skills to engage with any text or topic. So that a Shakespeare scheme isn't a Shakespeare scheme, it's a scheme that has to be centred on Shakespeare and built in all the other concepts and issues and skills and so on. And also it ignores then the careful planning of units in the new curriculum to include content looking backwards to previous schemes and forwards to future schemes in terms of content as well as skills. That's the longer term disciplinary knowledge with some embedded substantive content. Now with any assessment, it is, of course, also important to engage with the process through which the end results have been achieved. Another anecdote as exemplification. Uh, a local library ran a competition to decorate a pottery model of the children's storybook character Elmer the Elephant, famously multicoloured. A child submitted an entirely grey elephant, and of course the staff judging it were less than impressed. It was only when they looked more closely they noticed that the child had clearly coloured Elmer in with all the colours, but had then covered all those colours in grey paint, based on a story in which Elmer himself covers himself in berry juice in order to fit in with the other elephants by being grey. Now, while the end result may have been unimpressive looking, the process undertaken to arrive at that point actually showed a far greater and more perceptive understanding. So what's the point I'm making there? Well, what we're assessing is not simply the end product, but the process undertaken by the student to arrive at that final product. The difference between assessing, in some ways, based on a quality model or a difficulty model. And this lends itself to a distinction between how we assess English language and how we assess English literature at GCSE. Now, English language is judged in papers for all the major examples, AQA included, on a difficulty model with an escalating challenge in terms of question difficulty throughout the sections of the paper. It starts easy and it gets harder. English literature, in contrast, is based on a quality model, where all the questions share essentially the same difficulty. 
Now, this can be seen as, as lending itself to the teaching of discrete question-by-question -question skills in language, but cumulative skills in literature. But that is something of a fallacy. After all, skills still need breaking down in literature, and there is still a need to build to longer responses in language. And that means that the longer questions and the literature questions are based around, essentially, a test of either conceptualization can you draw together the wider discussion in a cohesive fashion? Or of memorization? Can you, in an exam, replicate a model previously constructed or taught? If we return to Key Stage 3 assessment as it currently stands in NET, they are modelled on an escalating difficulty model, with, student, uh, assessed, sorry, with students assessed on uh, continuous skills throughout the various steps, but with questions becoming increasingly challenging as the assessment progresses. It's accessible for everybody, the difficulty escalates, and it treats the skills both holistically and you know, on the smaller scale individually. So what criteria do we use when we assess? Now using meaningful criteria is essential, of course, for any effective assessment, particularly from an external or a top-down evaluative perspective. And it's also one that is made exponentially more challenging in the absence of shared and defined criteria for a given level, whether those be between staff, between you know, exam boards and schools, or between staff and students. For example, um, one of my children returned home to tell me that he had achieved 18 out of 20 on a spelling test. Now, obviously, being a doting father, I celebrated his success, praised his achievement, and, and so on. From an external perspective, though, it's difficult to say what that means. I mean, if the class mean was 12, it's comparatively impressive. If the class mean was 19, it's disappointing. If a previous assessment saw him scoring 15, then it's an improvement, unless previous assessments were on different words, in which case the value of any comparison is limited. Ultimately, it became a conversation about students in the class with similar ability levels in an attempt to gain some kind of steerage. The what did Chris get issue. My other son, showing the outcome of a maths assessment, told me he was now on red table. And even more obviously, there's the same issue. And again, the conversation rapidly becomes, well, who else is on that table? Essentially, without a fixed and clearly defined set of criteria, we end up asking, is that better than last time? Are you happy with it? Is it what you need? All also valid questions. Now, Daisy Christodoro, another you know, um, great thinker in terms of assessment, a uh, very useful person to be reading, back in 2018 voiced strong support for comparative marking rather than marking to an absolute standard, something she argued as being preferable in terms of reliability, efficiency and validity. Now that style of marking sees students marked against relative criteria such as quality of other submissions or more formally placed within a cohort, percentile, decile, quintile, quartile and so on. Now, when working through coursework folders, it was common practice in schools back in the day when we did coursework folders to organise the folders by mark and then check through them to ensure that the quality was comparable across the submissions that ended up in close proximity to each other. As a note, this style of marking can also, as kind of a halfway point, be usually, fact usually factored into marking through anchoring points where the anchoring assessments can be interpolated within the cohort to provide the fixed grade 3 to 4, 4 to 5 or 6 to 7 comparisons, with the remainder of the pieces then marked comparatively. So think, for example, about, say, standardisation samples used by exam boards in terms of the thinking. You know, we know these pieces are this agreed standard, so everything else you mark against them and you compare to them. This also helps to address the issue of variability of marking from class to class and from academy to academy, the old, oh, she's always harsh with her marking issue. And it's an issue that came back to bite some academies in last summer uh, during the ranking exercises. Even harsh or generous marking that falls within tolerance, a mark or so either way, can cause a major issue, as you know, in my career I found in, in, in entire academies in actual fact. After all, a low mark, a mark low across the seven criteria on a language paper, could cost the student an entire, an entire grade. Across two papers, that could be two to three grades, where no question is marked inaccurately, 
But that single mark difference actually can pull them down, you know, beyond the point of, 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 of failure, essentially. It can even become um, more concerning when it becomes, as I say, a, a house style in the academy. And I've come across academies who would proudly announce that, oh, we deliberately mark low to encourage aspiration, or we're generous with marking to help with motivation, both of which are equally problematic. This variability of marking against even apparently clear criteria such as GCSE mark schemes can be widespread. The majority of staff mark to the mean, but this will generally vary according to cohort. High ability cohorts often receive lower marks for responses that would achieve higher marks among the low ability cohort. During moderation, it can be pretty common to see top set staff accidentally and unintentionally penalising bottom set papers, and lower set staff over rewarding what they see as upper end responses. This can be particularly challenging in academies with a small cohort or where the cohort have a limited ability range. People still mark to the bell curve. This kind of bias can also be based on the student, including either confirmation or familiarity bias, either rewarding what is familiar to the teacher or penalising what is seen as unoriginal due to familiarity. In English, for example, over-rewarding students who follow the structures that we teach or penalising students who don't. Alternatively, under-rewarding students who repeat ideas discussed in class, ignoring the quality of the points due to a perceived lack of originality. And that's the sort of issue you'd find going into an academy, where they've marked students down for recycling ideas. But from an outside point of view, those ideas are exceptional, and they, are, and they appear to be original. Now, other biasing factors can be knowledge of the student, assumptions about behaviour, about handwriting, about presentation, about choice of point or topic. And you always have those conversations with students about thinking about you know, the examiner's point of view, the examiner's mindset. And an example taken from my own uh, first ever experience of exam board training, you know, we're talking um, 18 years ago now, saw a senior member of the subject team for that exam board referring to the Algernons and Arabellas as the higher achievers on one pile and the Kevs and Courtneys as the lower achievers on the other. Assumptions even based socioeconomically on the naming of these children. There's a temptation to see levels and grades of GCSE as being fixed and absolute and inviolable. However, even there, there's the issue of inbuilt comparison within the process. For English, perhaps more than almost any other subject, each year's exam cycle represents an annual semantic game of interpreting the vocabulary within the mark scheme. After all, the grade boundaries change from year to year to reflect the relative ability of the cohort and to prevent grade inflation or deflation following what's known as the, the sawtooth effect when they're first introduced. But level-based criteria don't change. What this means ultimately is the interpretation of the vocabulary and phrasing in the mark scheme changes from year to year. What it means this year is not the same as last year. And so that, that means that the meaning of the words and phrases must be different. To cut the waffle, what is clear this year may not have been clear last year, and may not be clear next year. The phrasing of the mark schemes is also an issue. Uh, Sherrington, to return to him, offers the example of two history statements. Beginning to develop a secure understanding, grade 5, and is developing a secure understanding, grade 6. With the difference between beginning to develop and developing all but meaningless from a semantic perspective. Even worse, I have seen schools and data processing companies attempting to push this even further with fine gradings, particularly exploiting the changes at Key Stage 3. So the difference, for example, between a point 0.8 and the point 0.9 above it, shifting from strongly beginning to develop to securely beginning to develop. Now, there are a range of issues with also extrapolating from marks to grades. A first is apparent precision not necessarily leading to incision in terms of inter interpretation. For example, if we simply extrapolate grades from, say, one of the four mark questions using the, you know, the, uh, the GCSE boundaries to one of the questions that begins language papers one and two, we end up with more than a grade attached to each mark that's available. So all results are clustered around four points and the data becomes all but meaningless. However, the opposite can also be a problem 
with boundaries or criteria so broad or so um, muddled or mixed or varied as to become unhelpful. English language AO5 was something that became problematic when it came to marking step papers. When looking to the data to enable meaningful inference, a 24 mark criteria was too broad for the kind of nuance needed, particularly when covering and essentially collating both content and structure marks. As an examiner, it can provide you with a perfectly clear mark, understandably. But what it doesn't do is allow, allow the nuance of feedback that you need. And that's exactly why, for those of you who have marked step papers for years 10 and 11 in NET, we split AO5 into AO5-1, the content, and AO5-2, the structure, each with 12 marks. Now, it was the desire for granularity of marking that resulted in the old Key Stage 3 APP grids. And that was a marking approach that was worthily intentioned, but ultimately unwieldy. That's not to say that the generally implemented current approach, awarding or predicting Key Stage 4 grades, is necessarily an improvement. Awarding GCSE grades as they are, after all, would see almost all Year 7 students awarded grade U's on arrival in their first assessment. So either pointless in terms of showing nothing, or just destroying confidence, or indeed both. And that's not to mention requiring the finer gradings at the lower end that we've already discussed, and encouraging the use of flight paths, popular a decade or so ago, but long since debunked and exposed for their inaccuracy, their unreliability, their self-referential circularity, and their undue influence on grading. So, we've talked about what assessment is, how we assess, when and how often we assess, what we assess, and what criteria we use. Let's briefly talk about how we use data and how we respond to feedback. Now, we could easily spend entire sessions exploring feedback, but to cut through to a definition, for Hattie in 2019, feedback is about closing the gap between current and desired learning. Now, what the inferences allowed by data do is, unsurprisingly, and this is hardly radical, allow teachers to adapt the learning, to adjust to fit the needs of the learners. The interpretation of the data is crucial, ensuring that inferences are both specific and meaningful. As an example, when unpacking results for Language Paper 2, question 4 often comes out as a key weakness, both in terms of the proportion of marks for the individual question and also the amount of marks dropped across the whole paper. So often there is pressure to simply teach question four again and again and again and again and again. However, that's often a symptom, under performance in question four, of a problem with the comparative aspects of question two, or of timing, rather than an issue with the specific question itself. Simply working on, often repeating question four, may yield apparent results in terms of timing improving, but it doesn't address the underlying issues. As in, the question two skills, which needed actually uh, addressing instead, despite the fact it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, has a lower mark tariff, or the timing across the whole assessment and the whole paper. Ultimately, the data must be interpreted in context. Also important is that students are taught how to receive, how to interpret, and how to use the feedback. Again, as Hattie argues, this is probably more important than the quantity provided by the teacher. Feedback is only meaningful in terms of the takeaway by the student. It's also crucial that this is a cognitive rather than an emotional response, and that's part of that training, and also that it's closely tied um, to perceptions of success and failure and an awareness of those, and thus to notions of motivation, self-regulation, and self-perception, and all of those factors come into play in terms of feedback and ensuring that feedback is taken meaningfully. Self-image is, is crucial in learning. Perceived failure is likely to uh, achieve you know, a result um, which is essentially apathy and opposition. Perceived success can result in students switching off. Now, as Butler back in 1988, Noted, a constant focus on grades skews perceptions towards what she calls ego involvement and away from task involvement. If you stick a grade on and low achieving students don't want <laughs> afterwards to read the presumably negative feedback, and then high achieving students don't need to read the presumably positive feedback. And if an assessment result simply validates the arrogance of the academic and the unhappiness of the underachieving, then what was the point? <laughs> 
Now, obviously, there are various feedback structures designed to work around those issues. From, for example, two stars and a wish, to requiring a response from the student to the teacher's response, so they had to read the feedback. Especially linked in that sort of um, instance to a redrafting of the original attempt. Now, one key method that has yielded effective results is switching from individual to group feedback. And you'll have seen that as a trend over the past year or so. A report by the DfE back in 2016 showed very limited difference for students in terms of impact, but a significant difference for teachers in terms of time, effort and stress. Group feedback is efficient, but it can also run the risk of becoming impersonal, of being perceived as irrelevant. As such, it needs to be coupled with effective initial baseline testing and additional granular level analysis where possible. And again, we return to the QLA. Now, regardless of that, research does seem to show clearly that the best feedback is verbal feedback. Again, to quote Sherrington, it's live, it's dynamic, in the moment, formative assessment that has no scale or score and can't be recorded meaningfully. It's the everyday dialogue of student-teacher interactions and formative checking processes. And even with the shift to virtual learning, that sort of interaction is still possible through the use of, say, the chat function and, and, and similar things. Hattie's conclusion regarding feedback, however, takes a different tack. For Hattie, the obsession over feedback from the teacher to the student is inverted. As he puts it, feedback is most powerful when it's from the student to the teacher. What they know, what they understand, where they make errors, when they have misconceptions, when they are not engaged. And then teaching and learning can be synchronised and powerful. Feedback to teachers makes learning visible. And ultimately, what that feedback is, is assessment. And that brings me to the end of the session. Hopefully there's been some food for thought in there and some prompts for further consideration and for action. As ever, many thanks for taking the time to engage with this and thank you for taking the time to engage with the course more generally. Now, since this is my final session on the course, I would like to say a huge thank you for participating. But obviously do watch out for the follow-up session on GCSE assessment that will be arriving in the near future. As a final note, if you are looking for further reading, and I would recommend several, I would particularly watch out for a couple of books by the two giants of assessment. That's John Hattie, uh, Visible Learning in 2009, but there's also a range of subsequent guides looking at different aspects of it. Um, invaluable stuff, phenomenal stuff. And also Dylan William, uh, Embedded Formative Assessment in 2011. But, you know, again, there's various things like um, you know, any of the black box work and so on. There's also an excellent overview of many of the key issues and the debates, uh, edited by Sarah Donarski and Tom Bennett, uh, which is the Research Ed Guide to Assessment, part of the Research Ed Guides series. Thank you very much, and take care.